right looks available. We've got a screen share to go. And let's go. Uh, so if you saw the title, um, the whole story of the of the is extraordinarily bizarre. I'm gonna mute you both. I hope you don't mind. Nothing, nothing personal. Mute all. Right, continue. Right, boom. Okay, so still see you. Um anyway, so basically the whole story is obviously peculiar in, in the extreme. They're gonna build a tower and they're gonna fight with God and uh, bizarre, bizarre stuff. And as a fact, we'll see tonight, uh well, it might be two weeks, but we'll start to see tonight how very, very surprisingly mundane or surprisingly familiar this whole process is. Uh, in the beginning, <laughs> in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, in Bracious, and it says Bracious borrowed came to Shemaim Basa Oritz, there's a famous Rashi there, um, and he says, uh, There was no requirement whatsoever to start the Torah except from the Posik, which of course uh, appears in Shemaim. When we are told uh, the, the first, or given the first mitzvah, to the whole of Palestine, which is that Nisan is the first of months, and you start your calculations from there. So therefore, he says, um, So therefore, if that's the case, then why start with Bracious? Why do we need the book of Bracious? In fact, the whole book will say for Bracious. And he says, The answer, it says Rashi, is to tell the enormity and the greatness of what he did to his children or to his people, the Sislam Nachlas Goyim, and give them the ability to take inheritance of the land of Israel. And if the non Jews say you stole it from the Palestinians or the Canaanites or whatever particular era, whoever they are going to accuse of stealing the land, then we're supposed to be able to turn to Boratius and point to Boratius and say, Look, Herzachain, you will say in Yiddish, pay attention here. Uh, after all, I mean, it's quite clear at the beginning of the Bible, the Shem created the world. It's his to do with as he wants. He gave it to them. They misbehaved. He took it from them. They gave it to us. End of story. Now, that might strike you as a very um, strange argument. Um, it certainly wouldn't go down very well in today's world. The Ramban certainly finds it very, very strange. This is what the Ramban says. And this is tremendously interesting. He quotes the Rashi. And he says, the Yesha Shobo. So having... Look to that Rashi, the Rambam says, You've got to ask a question here. There's an incredibly important reason to start the Torah with the book of Bracious. Um, this is the fundamental of Jewish belief. And anybody who doesn't believe in that and think the world just always was, like Sir Isaac Newton did, by the way, uh, that the world just always existed. Then who Then you are absolutely undermining or attacking the fundamentals of Jewish belief. They in and you don't have any Torah left, and you certainly can't consider yourself to be a religious Jew. But Shuvah. So therefore, what what is Rashi saying? So he said, well, the answer is like this. Because the story of Bracious is a side omak, an incredibly profound secret which you will not understand from a simple reading of the Pesukim. And all this was only understood as a Kabbalah that Moshe Rabbeinu got from Hashem Yisbarach. Even though he understood where it all meant, he was told to hide it. So it wasn't part of the Masira. It wasn't passed on to it in its full sense. So therefore, that's why Rashi says, the beginning of the Torah doesn't need to begin with Bracious Bora. Why? Because you're not going to understand it. If we establish the fact that you're never going to understand it, so therefore that, he says, is what Rashi is trying to get at. And the story of what was created in the first day, in the second day, in all the days of creation, and the detail it was into in the creation of Adam and Eve. And the hath the hot and the onshum their their sin, their mistake, and their punishment. The Sipagan Eden, the story of the Garden of Eden, the Gorish Adam the men and the expulsion of, of Adam. He calls their law Yuvan Bay no the Shalim and Minaksubim, because you are not going to really understand what's going on from a simple reading of the Psukim. But Kol Shakim the Sipa Kol Shakim. That's interesting. How much more so the Sipa Dor Hamabel? The story of the Dor Hamabel, and Noah's story, 
Hafloga, and the door of Hafloga, the door of Hafloga, the story of the Torah of Bovo. Shein at Tzarek Lehem Godel, but the, the, the necessity to know is not great, not what, what it really was about, it's not really great. We ask for the Anshi at Tzarek Lehem Godel, because it's not in it, and we don't really need these psukim to establish what the Yiddishkeit and Torah is all about. So says the Ramban. But that means to say that what we're about to delve into is so profound and so deep that you really are not going to be able to get to it. You're not going to see it at all from, you know, the Pesukim. So therefore, if we're in really, really deep waters here, uh, then you would expect uh, that you're going to go, well, what's that, what's that, what's that all about? Rabbi Dessler, in, in when he discusses the creation and his famous essay in Hillig Base, of how it is that Adam Rishon uh, made his mistake, starts off by saying that the same thing. We're talking about a totally different world, a totally different dimension. As he says there, Adam was a creature of light. Adam was a creature that the, the angels mistook for Hashem. That's radically different to you and I. The first man, of course, we know he's both male and female. But even uh, leaving that aside, if an angel came into this room now, or on Friday night when we welcome the angels, they don't go, oh, look, there's a Shem sitting at the top of the table. No angel's going to mistake me or you, uh, we as physical beings for Hashem is Borach. But Adam Rishon was so different that, of course, they did mistake him. Now, of, cor- of course, in, in the confusing um, um, Hashem with Adam Rishon simply points to the fact that Adam Rishon was so much greater than they were. But of course, he was just Adam Rishon. He was still the creation of the Shams. But they looked upon him as being, well, infinite, if you like. He went on and on, which he didn't, whereas Hashem did. But they couldn't distinguish. He was so much greater. Now, if that's the case, therefore, says Rabbi Desta, what's the point of this? So, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be in the Torah unless we could draw some conclusions, some application to ourselves and our lives, which are ultimately radically different. But if we could draw nothing from it, understand nothing of it, there would be no point to it. If it's in the Torah, therefore, there's something you can get from it. Even if, if we now understand Ramban's Pshat and Rashi, it's going to be something which is literally crumbs um, or molecules or atoms uh, from the, the whole of what it was all about. So just literally think of a different dimension, something completely different to our experiences. And that's really what we seem to be about to dip into. But as I said, it's bizarre, but natural fact is really, at the end of the day, not so bizarre at all. And it will start to make sense in just a, a few seconds time okay so with all that as an introduction to this great mysterious thing in chapter yud aleph of Rashish, let's just remind ourselves uh what it's all about i'm not sharing that with you uh i will share when we go to the alsha uh, what he has to say in the subject so aleph and yud aleph and it's the story of let's uh, at least let's remind ourselves because the alsha is going to ask a number of questions uh, on this and he says the following thing. Um, I'll look it up. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the Yama Elohim. Oh, so that's not right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not right. It's not right. right. Oh, no, no. Wrong, wrong uh, reference. Yes. <laughs> you now laugh, Alephant. Sorry, tired. Um, I'm very tired. You know, it's, it's the stress of the election. Uh, right, so here we go. Um, so what happens is, by he call her Oris, this is Shvi in Parshas Nach, by he call her Oris was Sofa Echos, and the whole world was one language. But Dvorim Achodim, and literally words of oneness, or Dvorim Achodim, I don't know how you would really translate that, but keep that in mind. By he, Benosam Miken, when it was when they traveled from the east, by Yimsa Bika, and they found a valley. But Eretz Shinar in the land of Shinar, by So the whole of humanity, it seems, makes an, an, a, a huge migration. They move from the east and they come to the west. And for Yomru, and each Ish says to his neighbor, let us build bricks or uh, bake bricks. We'll put them in a kiln, but he'll have them in Evan, and we'll have these bricks as like stones. And they can use, they can use uh, um, uh, mortar, and we will build We'll build a city, and the tower will go up to heaven, and we'll make for ourselves a name, 
pay not its open air or us, lest we are scattered throughout all of the world. It's getting very strange, this story. The year of the Shem Leroy is our year. Now, the next bit is astonishing. And the Shem comes down to see the city, the Es Migdal and the tower, Asher Bona Bani Aldam, which humanity had made, by Yomra Hashem. And Hashem says, Hin Am Echon, they are one people, the Sofa Achas, with one language, Lukulam for all of them. And this is what they've begun, they started to do. And therefore, now as a consequence, nothing of what they intend will be withheld from coming true. This will be a success. And therefore, and therefore, if I don't intervene and change um, their languages, their one language, to many languages, to cause power, to cause conflict between them, then indeed what they want to do, which is to fight with me, will be a success. And they will, it, it's very, very strange, but it's the Chumash, they'll beat me. And they will beat me. So I've got to stop them now. I need a preemptive strike to stop them. If I don't, then they'll win. And that's utterly baffling. Okay, now that's the story, and I think we all know the story, but just having read all of that, it certainly does, uh, I think, emphasize how very bizarre this whole idea is. But as I said, it's bizarre, but it's going to be not bizarre at the same time. Let me read to you some of the Rashi's, uh, sorry, some of the Alsha HaKodesh's questions here. So if you've never learned the Alsha before, here it is. Ramosha Alsha, in the case if you don't know, Ramosha Alsha was a Talmud of Rabbi Karo. We got Smicha from Rabbi Karo. You'll have heard of at least two of his Talmudim, and that was uh, the Arizal and Rukhain Vital. Uh, and he was the Dayan of the Sfas based team. Uh, he wrote a, t- a parish in the whole of the Talmud. We don't have that anymore. It's probably sitting in some storehouse or somewhere in the Vatican. Um, but uh, anyway, this is what he says. His technique, you'll find this similar to the, to the Rukhain, the Barbanel. Uh, that in those times, it's very common for them to ask many, many questions, analyze very, very acutely what the Posse has to say. And the basic pr- premise of the al is, well, this was well, the premise of everybody, that uh, when you're looking at the Chumash, you've got to say to yourself, and when I say this in my shirim, it sounds as though I'm joking, but I'm really being quite serious. Uh, you've got to say to yourself two things. Who wrote the book? To which hopefully the answer comes back, Hashem. He's the author of the book. Moshe wrote it down. So he dictated it. And Moshe is like the secretary who writes it down. And then, after having done that, having said that, then you've got to say to yourself like this, there's only one word that does not occur in the vocabulary of the Almighty. If Avi can switch on his microphone, he will tell us what that word is. Avi, what's the one word that does not occur in the vocabulary of the Almighty? I couldn't hear you. What one word does not occur in the vocabulary of the Almighty? Perfect. Okay. Does not appear in the Torah. Yeah, the, the word I usually use is oops, right? Yeah, okay. is oops. I was, I was waiting for you to do oops. It was a big dramatic moment. Um, <clears throat> I must not have said this for a, lot, for a while, or you would have remembered. Oops, right? Hashem never gets things wrong. So if you're looking at the Posuk and there's something wrong with the Posuk, in other words, the word's misspelled, the vault missing that should be there, and the vault there that shouldn't be there. If it's in the, in, in the wrong tense, future instead of past or, or, or present, if it's the wrong gender, um, if you get 10 words in a posuk and five would do to tell the story of the posuk, what's the other five doing there? And that's the sort of question that the way that al uh, looks at this, but he, he's incredibly sharp. So I want to read to you some of the questions he asks, and then we'll start to see how this extremely strange world that we've delved into, which as the Ramban said, is way beyond our comprehension, still is something that will ring a bell and will strike a chord as being um, relative to our times. And if you saw in the news uh, the last two days what's been happening in Vienna, uh, you will see that this is a, it rings a bell with the Tower of Babel, which comes as a surprise when I see. So he says, So I said that the whole world was just one language. Roy loss and maybe says, it's, a, it's appropriate, says the Alshik, you, you, you should consider. Why is that critical? Why is that important? The Torah has to tell us that they all spoke one language. That's how the story begins, right? By he called Oretz of Achas. So who cares? Right? In in Hayas called Oretz of Achas. What's that got to do with it? 
two. And my whole Indian devorim achodim lefi pshulah. What does it mean that they were all had one language and devorim achodim, and literally words of one. They were talking about one, right? Or ones, two ones, as we'll see in a second. Um, and the Chazal say in Breshis Rabba, Man Chesvov, Sha Omro, oh, you know, I can share this with you. Shall we share this? You want to see this inside? And you can actually say you've learned Alshik in case you've never done so before. I'll tell you what, I prepared this before. So if I share the screen and I press in this ground, this brown thing over here, you know, it sh should bo bounce in a second into life. This is always the horrible, hairy moment when you press the button and nothing happens there, and then it does it for you. Hooray! Um, ah, sorry. We'll come to that in a second. Let's, I can come out of that because I'm, I'm premature. I'm not sharing yet. I'm sharing when we get to the answers. I'm going to stop sharing again, and then we'll come back to that in a second. There, that's an exciting moment. Oh, I've got you all excited. We're going to get there. What in there? Right, okay, back to this. So that's the, uh, the, the question. Um, what's the one things that they're talking about? Bresha says, Omra Devorim Achodim. The ones that they were talking about, what the whole of humanity was discussing at the moment, at that time, was Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Now there is no Yisrael, and there is no Posik in the Torah which has been given, because there's no Torah that's been given. But as we're going to see, that this was a completely different world, a world which was dominated by mystical forces. We already see this with regards to, to Avram Avinu. Does anybody know how old Avram Avinu was at the Tower of Babel? 48. 48, well done, Avi. He was 48 years of age. Now, you know, we've been looking at the Psukim uh, about Avram Avinu uh, at the moment, and you'll remember, just recently we read it in Shul, when he turns around and says, what can you give to me, Shem? I'm not going to have any children. And Shem says, you will have any. You will have children. Um, you're going to have your own children, which Avram Avinu, of course, was physically incapable of doing. He was born the Tumtum, which the Gemara Nivoma Samach Nalad says is incre incredibly injurious to being able to father a child. Um, and of course, as we know, uh, the Imams were all uh, unable to have children, and Sora particularly, because she doesn't have a womb. All right. Says the Gemara in Shabbos and when it discusses whether or not Jews are affected by Mazel, a little bit more fills in the details about what Hashem said to Avram, and Avram answered back. So he says, you are going to have children. That's what we got in the Chumash. But then Avram said, according to the Gemara, it's tautib, it's tagnuniashli. I've looked into this using my, my powers of astrology of our own, and I can see that I'm not going to have any children. To which Hashem says, say me, it's an initial call, ignore astrology, she'en maz Yisrael. Now, just before uh, we go on to that, let me just point out that the forces of the planets is real. There is a thing called mazel. And these planets and stars are set up according to the Rambam in Hilchus of Zorah. How did Avodah Zorah get start, started? He said, because Hashem created these stars and planets, here's the Hebrew, Lahanig Esa Olam, the first peric, the first halacha in Hilchus of Zorah. Hashem created Kochovim, Bogalgalim, Lahanig Esa Olam, to create events, to make things happen in this world. As Rabbi Yerucham and Das Chochum Musa goes into great lengths to point out, but don't make the mistake of thinking that Avodah Zara was hocus pocus and silly, you know, um, sleight of hand, trickery. It was not. It had real power. And imagine that you could take that power and bend it to your will to make it do what you want. And so he says, Rabbi Rocham says, that you should know that, that, that real Avodah Zara, the ability to take that energy that comes from the planet to make things happen here, that we're able to use that for their own ends and for their own purposes, they can make you rich, they can make you poor, they could look into the future using instagninius, using astrological powers, that's what Avram Avinu says. I've looked into this using my astrological insights, which allows me to look into the future, and I'm not fated to have a child. Twitter says yes. Well, that's only because you've not done Lech Lecho yet. And of course, there's this concept we're all familiar with, Shina Mok and Shina Mazel, that who and what you are, your intellect when you were born, um, where you were bright, super bright, average like myself, or not so average, uh, below average, then that's all a component of where you were born because the mazel has an effect when you were born and where you were born. But very often when there is a crisis in somebody's life, the last Kashima, maybe a very serious illness. I, I certainly remember in Gateshead with a family called Bamberger who had been living in Zurich and one of their children fell from a veranda from a balcony uh, about four, four uh, floors below 
and uh, then Baruch Hashem onto the, 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 the roof of a car. So he made a, quite a dent in the roof of the car, but the bending of the metal absorbed a lot of the force. But he did suffer brain damage, this boy. And I taught him. He was uh, I taught him in the Gates of uh, it's called Jew, Gates of Jewish boarding school. We would call it yeshiva in American terms. Um, but very, very sweet child, lovely, lovely young man. Liked him a lot. But when they asked the Shiloh, what should they do? Why did this happen? Whoever they asked him, they would be asking somebody very big. He said, move, leave Zurich. So they moved to Gates. Said, Shina Mokum, Shina Mazel. Because where you are and when you're born, etc., all that's going to affect what you are. So Abram can't have any children. I've looked into the future. I can see I can't have any children. I said, yeah, that's fine. But the point of 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 of, of Zara, the point the point of the planetary forces moving to the world and affecting the world, incidentally, without even uh, going too deep into this, we know that uh, think about an extraplanetary uh, object or another planet uh, which affects things in this world. And the obvious one is the moon, which for it, you know obviously affects the tides, affects women's birth cycles. Um, we all know when we keep uh, when we keep Hilchus uh, Nida. There is, in anticipation of the beginning of a menstrual cycle, there is something called um, uh, a vessel which is controlled by the by Hachoidish, vessels Hachoidish, controlled by the moon. Somehow or other, the effect of the moon causes um, changes in a woman's body and can provoke every month, um, you know, the onset of a period. Uh, people who are seriously mentally ill, very often, uh, their behavior becomes far more erratic and far more hysterical when it comes to the new moon, which of course is why mentally ill people are called lunatics. It was observed that the lunar uh, forces do have an effect, but there's more than that. And that's what planets do. So they've got, there's a force coming from the planets, which you can use. You can see the future. Uh, we, we'll see that in a second. That's exactly what Paro's magicians did when they saw the birth of a child who was going to threaten, um, to th threaten Paro, kill all the boys. But Nimrod, who is, of course, the architect, the prime architect of the story of the Torah of Amal, then his Khartoumim, his uh, people who were able to use these forces to look in the future, saw that there was going to be an Avram. And again, he tried to kill all the boys, failing, of course. But the Echod that they're talking about is, we'll see it in a second. And the other one is that Avram is an Echod. Yeah, he survived. You didn't kill him, but don't worry. We can see, and he could see, that he can't have any children. He's an echod. He is a barren, he's a, he's a husk, he can't have any children. And it's because I'll tell us that all the nefesh, all, all the tremendous uh, uh, disciples and converts that he had created only lasted one generation. None of them were able to pass it on. The only way that true Yiddishkeit, true Israel, would, would be created is through this first Jew called Avram. Now, don't worry, boys, because he can't have any children. Shem says you can, but you're going to have to move in order to do so. I always think about Ma Mazel as affecting us. It's a bit like, you know, you know, when they fire missiles, Rechom uh, on into from Gaza into Israel. And they also got this thing called Iron, is it called Iron Dome. When they set up a counter missile, it intercepts the missile, boom, it blows it up, so it's not, no longer in danger. And that's a bit like Mazel. Because an Avram does a mitzvah, lech lecha, I'm telling you to go, so he goes, he, he performs a mitzvah. Here comes the, the missile saying, you're not going to have any children, boom. Here is now a counter missile, an Iron Dome thing, which blows it away. So the force of a mitzvah is able to change. Shina Mok and Shina Mazel is able to uh, affect, affect, uh, affect the, the forces of the Mazelos. So he says, there are two things we're talking about. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkein Hashem Echov. And the fact that Avram is only one. Okay, that's what they were talking about. Very strange stuff. This whole idea that they moved to the east, what's that all about? And what's this whole business about building a city and the tower and bricks and all that stuff? What is, what's it all about? So now at this point, I do share the screen. So let's go back to sharing the screen with you. And I share that and I press that and I bring it over to the begin, middle of the screen. And I make it bigger and stretch the screen as well. It's incredibly multi-talented. Oh, not just an ordinary rabbi, a super technically competent one. Okay, so if you if you look up here, here's the alshik here. Okay, you with me? Can you all see that? If I, sh if I shake this about, it usually turns out an arrow. But anyway, vahine. But tonight, just because it's in a bad mood, um, 
because I switched it on and I switched it off again, it's not going to do it. But well, that should be nice and clear. Bene, Lavola, in it says the Alsha can already can see all my my little notes and stuff like this. Um, Lavola, in it, Niskar and Maimon Mazal, the Medrash Rabba, this is a famous Medrash, the Mazel Shana, a tebna by cash, the straw and the chaff, and Medain and the they had an argument with each other. Is that Omar Bishulini? Is that all I saw? The the, the straw said the, uh, the farmer sold the seed from it for me. Is that Omar Bishvilini? Is that I think it really means the the, the the corn and the and the and the stock. Um, and uh, but no, it was for me. Omra Chitim. You know, so now the grain says, "I'm teno adshi yoba hagerin." Hold on, you guys think it's because of you? Just wait till the gorin comes. That's interesting. That the medrash, of course, is very important. So get heaven and cash, straw and ca- and chaff. Okay. But along comes the, the he team and says, oh, you two guys, you wait and see. There's an incredibly interesting Ramban. And the Ramban occurs in the, uh, in not, not in his parish in the Chumash, but in the famous Vikua Haramban. The Vikua Haramban, of course, as you know, in the court of King James I of Aragon, whose capital was Barcelona, and there was no Spain. It's a trick question. People say, where did the Ramban live? And people say, Spain, no, he didn't live in Spain. There was no Spain in those days. It was not a united kingdom of Spain. That was in 1492 under Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, and the Shatkin, incidentally, was a rabbi. But leaving that aside, um, that basically he was the king of a place called Aragon, which is on the northeast coast. Um, and the, and it's a, a famous area because Garono is there. So Rabini Yoina lived near there. And the, Ram, the Ramban was the rabbi of Barcelona. I mean, Barcelona, I should say properly. Opera Chitim. And now the grain says, I'm telling you, actually, you're about Gordon, but on any I didn't just feel me, Nisra You wait until the harvest and you'll see who's kept, who's precious, and you, and who's discounted the chap or the straw. Or me, says the, says the, says the, says the actual grain. And there he says, in the famous Bikoka Ramban, when King James I made the Ramban had spent four days in dispute with a, an apostate priest called Pablo Cristiani. Uh, not only did he have to debate which religion was right, but he had to do it in front of all the bishops and the cardinals, the king himself, and, and the whole of the palace. And it wasn't just a Pablo Cristiani. He was the main, his main uh, uh, opponent, but all, they all had a voice. And he, there he says, interestingly, when it says in the Torah that, uh, that the, you've, uh, the Revolution will eventually bring uh, vengeance on soinecho your enemies and your haters and this the Ramban said in the very last day of the Bikuach it says who are your enemies and who are your haters these two expressions one is the Christian world and one is the Muslim world they will eventually um, Hashem will bring them to book for well uh, you can see my little note here proclaiming themselves to be the new Israel and I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but the church calls itself the new Israel, New Testament, New Covenant, all this sort of stuff. God's changed his mind. We are the real deal. We are the new Israel. Islam claims the exact same thing about Christianity. Yeah, that was right. Uh, but then he changed his mind again, and there's another new deal, and that's called Islam, Quran, and all that sort of stuff. So it's interesting that, that the Medrash talks about the Tevin and the, and the Kash, the, cha- the, the, the chaff and the straw. Um, it's a, it's a remez. To the world of Christendom and the world of Islam. Uh, but what is the, the grain? Uh, so of course, what happens is that the harvest comes and these are the, the chaff and the, the straw are just set aside. And uh, But the real thing that makes the bread, that's his straw. So Hashem takes the 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 chitim and it turns it into into food into bread etc. Kach oideli similarly with a, a idolaters. Omrim ona iker. We are the real deal. We are the guys. We are the real thing. And we shall lay in the And because of us, the rabbanu created the world. That's precisely the argument of the Christians and precisely the argument of Islam, which is why I referred to the terrorist attack the last couple of days in in Vienna. Uh, of course, an ISIS sympathizer because they think they're the real deal and we are the bad guys. And the other one, the chap says, No, it's us. So that was the Moshul, is the chaff and the straw. But the reality is the, not, the idolatrous world, but it's not talking idolatrous, 
actually in our and that my explanation. But here it is. We'll see in a second how. Well, on a yoyim mishriel me nivra oilam, and we'll see who created the world. That's what it says in a yoyim bo. We're going to come a day. Says Pasuk Yishehu, va'alehem hu oimer. This is Yishehu. It's Israel Baruch. They some throw them up into the air. Of course, the the chaff is uh, is blown away by the wind. The winnowing process, leaving the, the seed, the, the precious wheat behind. I'll be strong, but after the goal, Hashem, I can't. Can who Indian who can ever mean a Doria? Keep it up with that bit. The idea is trying to get across is that this there is a claim from the world of Avoid Zora that they're the real deal and we are not, which sounds purport, preposterous. But as I said, even though this is very, very uh, esoteric and very mystical and Kabbalistic, the, and we'll see more in a second. Um, at the end of the day, it does resonate with our life and our time. We live in times where at least two major world religions claim that they are Israel, and we are for just leaving aside these uh, African American lunatics uh, who killed the the Jews in Jersey City a year ago or ten months ago, claim that they are the real Jews, and that sort of argument seems to be while getting a lot of traction in the in the African American community today. And now, if you really want to understand what's going on here, I have to tell you eight Kabbalistic principles. And I'm not sure if we'll get very much more, but um, this is a recording. So this will be on my, once we finish this, I'll put this share onto uh, my page in my, uh, I've got a YouTube channel. So you can look at my YouTube channel. Um, you can see all that. You can take a, a screen capture of this. Um, and uh, also it will be in tarayanytime.com. So that means you will have the ability to uh, review this by the time we finish this off next week and get to the crux of this. But let's look at eight Kabbalistic principles, which are necessary to know in order to understand what's really going on in this strange, strange story of a totally um, alien uh, civilization, al alien existence, which was humanity at that time. Very different to you and I. So principle number one. Now this is not too Kabbalistic. Or, um, in other words, you can understand this at a much more mundane level. And that is, as Shlomo Melech says, Zul For every positive that Hashem created, He created an opposite and equal negative. So that's why when we rebuilt the temple, the second temple was rebuilt, then Chazal Daven for Hashem to remove avoid a Zora from the world, not little statues. People would still, if they're complete lunatics, bow, bow down to, sta to statues. The ability to manipulate those forces that come from the planets to produce results that you want, that's real avoid a Zora, that was taken away from the world. And of course, if that was taken away from the world, what else went simultaneously at the same time, at the same moment? And the answer is Nevius. That's when we lost Nevius. Because that's the Zul Umazubor Elohim, that this one equals that one. The incredible things that we could do with prophets who could look into the future, etc., who could make you well when you were sick, who could tell you what to do to become rich, they had the same ability only using negative forces. It's called Kitsoinim. So for every positive, there's the equal and opposite negative. Kizel Umazer Ose Elohim. Hashem created an equal and opposite negative. Point number one, that one's quite well known, so that's not too, exci not too exciting. Or confusing. Two, ki kedusha achas he tatlas achdus. Kedusha, and this is a bit mm -hmm. a, a bit more um, unknown. Kedusha is by definition equal to the word one. The, the ultimate kedusha is a shem is boruch, obviously. The ultimate kodesh, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. The angels say, uh, talking about shem, and of course the nature of a shem, echad. This is a very profoundly difficult idea way way beyond there's no components there are no different aspects of god he's all one ultimate kedusha requires the host of kedusha the receiver of kedusha to be one that's very important every all bechina every aspect of it is one but these forces we're talking about before the negative forces the the avoid the zora forces then they are kiyesh pered v'riba tikram olam apered. They are innately not one. So that's a, a complicated idea. God and kedusha is one. And I'll give you. I'll let the cat out of the bag. 
we say Erev Shabbos Mincha, Toecha B'Shim Ko Echod, Omika Amko Yisrael Ko Echad Be'Orev. The innate nature of Kal Yisrael is to be one. That's why it famously it says, Vashibin Nochesh, said the soul, in the singular, went down to Egypt, applied the principle I said at the beginning, God's good at Hebrew, he doesn't say, oops, it should say 70 souls, but uh, Hazal all say, ah, that's a hint to the fact that really the innate nature of the Jewish people is one. We are all one people. I'm sure you, I'm sure you read my column religiously, no pun intended, in Indian magazine, and I don't know if you do, but a few, a few months ago, I wrote about my non-Jewish friend who lives along the road here, um, in, in Inwood, and uh, he's called Angelo, and he is Italian. And he was actually born in Rome, so I have a Roman neighbor. And, and we're quite pally when we were talking, and he told me that he was, the, the house that he lives on, uh, he was brought up in that house. Um, it was his father's house, so they moved here when he was just a little boy. Uh, and of course, this whole neighborhood, as we all know, uh, was, was actually originally Jewish, but not religiously Jewish. Then the Italians took over, and now, you know, full cycle, we're taking over again um, and buying all the houses inflating the prices, which drives them mad because they're getting a lot more for the houses that they got. The Jews haven't moved in, but they can dislike us at the same time. But not my pal, Angelo. Uh, anyway, so basically, Angelo said something very interesting. Growing up here, um, he, his family knew their neighbors on the right-hand side and the left-hand side and nobody else. But this whole neighborhood where we all live is, or was when I moved in here, all Italians. And they all came from, the, came from the same country. They all speak the same language. Um, and yet they have nothing to do with each other. Whereas when I said, when you told me that, I said, that's so interesting because us, we all know each other. And we're all friendly with each other. And a lot of us are related to people in the community. I am. Um, yeah, the family who moved in here about a year ago and through marriage related to me. They're so blessed. Um, but the basic nature of, and the same posse that says 70 soul went down to Egypt, it talks about Esau as having nefoshus basai, the souls, plural, of his household. The innate nature of the non-Jewish world is to be diverse. The Swiss are different to the Germans, and the Germans are different to the Austrians, are very different to the Italians, are certainly different to the French, and the Swedes, and the North. They're all different. But ultimately, all Jews are the same. Okay, so that's that. Gimel. Now, since the fact that the Klal Yisrael comes from Kedusha, that's what we're called, and all the numbers, the millions of Jews, still are considered to be one soul, as it says, Shivim Nofesh. The opposite, the, the opposite in the non-Jewish world, no, they're different, they're diverse. They're meant to be diverse for their own individuality. So they're all, okay, like you said before, nefoshis basa. That's familiar stuff. Four, we're nearly halfway there. Now we're going back into deep Kabbalistic things. And that is, no, we say every morning in our davening, um, the Rabban Shem creates the world every day. It wasn't that Hashem created the world and that's it, done, bush, planets and stars, you look after it, I'm going off to another part of the universe to do whatever I'm going to do, which is how a void are started believing that. But no, in actual fact, the, the existence of the world is an ongoing, in the present tense, a machadish bakal young mesibracious. Whatever forces come to this world that sustain it and keep it, the, the globe spinning in space and everything that makes up the universe, is an ongoing process that comes from Hashem to keep it there. And he says, The non-Jewish world, the physical, the physical existence of the universe requires that force that is brought down here or brought into the universe by Kedusha, by the Actus, by Kedusha. That's wrong. As is known, mechoch a euphemism for Kabbalistic masters. And another interesting thing, he tov All of these forces, all of these these peoples in the world, they all draw down a sustaining force for them. 
they're sustained, they exist through that force. Kamaima Sefer Zor, as the Zor says, Alaposa Kakfinim Shogim and Shogim Lutarev. Akis Yisrael Aisim Ritsoyna Shalmokim, but listen to this, when Kalam Yisrael gets it right and does what we're meant to do and lives in the place that we're meant to be, which is the land of Israel, Noisen Ashpal Yisrael Amis Matzison Ba'enenim Gamhem. What happens is that force comes down to cloud the stroll, down from the place which is closest to earth, which is Yerushalayim, in a straight line, comes to cloud the stroll, and that force spreads out to the rest of the world. However, that's when we're getting our job right. And as I'm giving this year in New York, clearly we're still not. Um, because you ain't, because you ain't icing, but when we don't do what we're supposed to do, and particularly when we're in Golas, then that's the sustaining force that's supposed to come to us and spread to them, goes to them, and we get the crumbs from the table that comes to us. And that's exactly the, the, the metaphor he uses. Then we get the crumbs that, that left over from them. Now that's crucial. That is to say that the world can exist through that force is drawn from heaven through us, or it can exist without us. Is that the seesaw that Yitzhak was referring to in the brachas that he gave to Esav? That when Yaakov is up, you guys will be down and vice versa? Exactly. Yes, exactly. Well, we understand that generally, so especially if we come to the Kanaka, you know, physical war, negative forces against positive, but all that sort of stuff, the heroes, the good guys and the bad guys. But in actual fact, what you're saying is, is, is a very, very astute observation and application of what we're saying to, yeah, it's exactly what's going on here. And if you look, I mean, in the history of the last 2,000 years, it's interesting. Um, you hear me talking in my shame all the time about Dennis, which uh, I think is the most beautiful country, uh, city I've ever been in, in the world. And it, uh, it really is. People say, oh, you're a lion? No. Any objective analysis of the beauty of Yerushalayim, which of course emotionally I think is the most beautiful place in the world, but compared to Venice, compared to you know the great cities of, of Europe, no. Uh, when they have had dominance and that force has gone to them, uh, then look what they've done with it. They've made great beauty. Um, but when it comes to us, and remember, when, when Mashiach comes, then Erzus all changes. At the moment, the beauty of Eretz which I really do think is a beautiful country, but it will be enhanced exponentially when it'll go back, it'll expand in size. And you know, remember what the Gemara says when the temple was destroyed, then the, the, the taste of food, the taste of wine, it was all reduced and all minimized. We're going to get it all back again. We're going to get Eretz Israel back again. Okay, let's get through these eight, and then I'll, I'll leave you to all next week, and we'll put this all together. Vov, ki yoset tsar, now this is interesting. Ki yoiser tsar margeshes ashkina kebiyocho vashpia av yitzarim v'loi lono. It's incredibly painful to God to have to send the force, the sustaining force, the energy that keeps the world going to us, as it were, uh, as plan B, that we get the crumbs and not directly to us. Yoiser v'asher nargish anachnu. It gives him more pain than it gives us that we are the wandering Jew and our we live in shtetls and wooden shacks when they've built mansions and palaces. Combined with Sefer Zor, as Azor says, ooh, we're bending around. Kimar Loma Ad, it gives Shem a lot of pain. Two more to go. Another Kabbalistic principle. Kim Az Borel Kim Odom Alor. From the moment Hashem created a human being on the planet, the purpose was, as Rashi says, Rashi's bar the king, Bishvil Rashi's, what's Rashi's? It's a euphemism for Klaal Yisro. The whole purpose of the world was that in order to be a Klaal Yisro. That's not to negate the non-Jews. Absolutely not, because our, our job ultimately is to inspire the non-Jewish world. That's what we're here for. But the ultimate in inspiration is available when Klaal Yisro gets it right, and we act as a beacon, and we act as a moral and ethical and religious uh, 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 lighthouse, if you like. To the rest of the world. But we Israel, Bali Nishamas Kadoshos, because they have a Nishamas Kadoshos. Or the Hashlim call Nishmas and Bishabaguf, when we perfect all the souls that are in our body. Laman, the Akrasi Yom, so at the end, Yevara Eichel might subsell it, so that people will be able to see the straw and the chaff 
that the world of Islam, the world of Christianity, might have bits that connect them to us in the same way as the chaff and the straw is connected to the wheat as it grows. But the thing, the main thing, the main purpose, that's the straw, which will be um, something very positive for them as well. So that through us, the world will never be destroyed. At all, just go to Ches, because we're running out of time. Ches, ki eno oil mazel, am ashu gashmi. And the last thing you must say is that the world, because it's a physical world, this kind cannot exist in law, but shtal shal shreifa min ha lomas el yonim. Except that's the mechanism we call yom tov. Maps and variations already discussed. Unless that force continually comes from heaven, the force of creation. It's really repeating what you said before. It's possible for that to come using external tubes, as it were, who will, as we said before, and go out to the world, from heaven. Or it's possible for that force to come straight down from heaven to Yerushalayim. You ever seen these pictures of these guys, you know, not scuba divers, but deep sea divers, with these big brass helmets, and they go walking, and they go, Thing that goes around them like that brass also they go walking in the seabed have you seen that stuff ever seen that and the guys in the ship above they put down this this tube and uh, in the old days because they'd be able to use that technology for about uh, 150 years uh they sort of like pump air uh, down so the guy can breathe now of course they've been done and it's still used that technology today by the way um for really deep sea diving um so basically here's the pipe the air's coming what happens if the guy walks away so the, pe- the, the pipe gets bent? Think of your, your garden hose. If there's a kink in the pipe, what happens? Then it's not so, it's not so, uh, it's harder to breathe. You're not getting what you want. When the world is perfected, when we get it right, we're living in your shalom, the pipe comes straight so that maximum flow of air, now called the air conditioner. If, however, we're not, and the air goes that way, that's more, it's, uh, it's contracted and constrained. That's what I'm saying. When the Mashiach comes, it'll be back straight. Your Shalom expands as well. So he says, um, Then the ultimate is when the world gets the Ashba that it gets from heaven through your Shalom and Sion. Sion, incidentally, is Migdal Dobi. According to the, the deep mystical secrets of Kabbalah. Oi Esher, or it's possible. But from tubes that will go down that way to the non-Jewish world. And that means again that the world can exist without Klaus Rom. And the world can exist without Klaus Rom. Oh, the the But that doesn't, even though it can work that way, you can't possibly compare what happens when the world gets it through us because their basic nature is they're Romans, they're distinct, they're different, they don't come together, they're not Amechod, whereas we are Amechod, so therefore it comes through us. It's a much better, a clearer, um, uh, more pure distillation of Kedusha. Magal Miska, my man, Sefer Zara, and the Zara also says, Ki Orma Yimsa Beka, and it says, they found a Beka. So they moved from the East, the people, but at that time, they say that there these, Two ones they're worried about. That is the nature of God is one. And we're not one. They knew what their nature is. We're not one. And there's Avram Avinu. And then it says they moved to the east. Why? The Zohar says, They found the valley. The same way as there is Zulu Umasu Boro Lakim. That they have, we had prophecy, could do incredible things. They had to have negative forces of Vaidazora who could also do negative things. There's a positive place in the world which allows the most beautiful, fullest um, collection of Kedushan that comes from Shemaim. It's a city called Jerusalem. It's got a tower and it's at the top of a mountain. But there are negatives as an anti-Jerusalem. Instead of a mountain, it's a valley. But it's got a city with a tower. That is a copy of Jerusalem and Migdal David but a negative copy of Yerushalayim and Mikhail Dovin. And they know that. And we'll be able to use that to draw down that force that keeps the world going without necessity of Klaus Yisrael 
The world can exist without, the world can exist without cholesterol. As Hashem said, if I don't stop them, they'll win. And we'll need to go into that more depth in, in shortly or next week. Um, there was just that Jerusalem is the focus when Kalashal is at its zenith. There's a negative anti Jerusalem which can gather all the forces together, all the negative forces and all the negative peoples of the world. In order to create their desire to replace Kalashal, to replace Kalashal and make it come true. Uh, how are we doing for time? Oh, okay. I think that'd be a good place to stop because we have, uh, yes, that's, uh, gosh, that's quite late, 55 minutes. Okay, have you got the idea? Are you with me so far? Very good. Have we got the basis? That's what's going on here. They are aware that they, they are clever. We'll see this more in the Alshach next week. They know how to make, a, set up a, 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 a whole uh, regime which will not need a cloudless row. They don't see Avram Avinu as being a threat because they can't have any children. That's good. They know the nature of the sustaining force that comes from the world. These are the two ones that we're discussing. And we'll see exactly how they're going to go about in replacing Paul's role and why that's so dangerous uh, next week. So this is part one. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.